Chapter 13 Constantinople 3 The Abolition of God The Sixth Ecumenical Council, the Third Council of Constantinople, met in 680 to 681. It is the last of the councils acknowledged by the Eastern and Western churches alike, and Orthodox Protestantism as well. The Seventh Ecumenical Council, the Second Council of Nicaea 787, is not recognized by Protestants because of its defense of images. The problem again was humanistic heresy. For some, this statement is guilty of reductionism, of oversimplification. They are insistent on seeing good faith on all sides, but with intellectual misunderstandings governing some or all of the participating theologians and bishops. The problem, we are told, was a complex one. It was compounded by the differences of meaning created by Greek and Latin terms. It was further compounded by rather dubious psychologies derived from the ancient world which governed the conciliar definitions of Christ. We cannot, therefore, too readily agree with the conciliar definitions of orthodoxy and heresy it is suggested. The answer to this is that, in terms of biblical faith, man's basic problem is not inadequate knowledge but sin. Man sinned deliberately and willfully against God. He sought to make himself rather than God the ultimate source of truth and law, the basic point and frame of reference. As Van Til has written, quote, A sinner man seeks to make himself instead of God the ultimate aim as well as the ultimate standard in life, end quote. Moreover, Van Til has added, quote, Here then is the heart of the matter. In Adam, man has set aside the law of his creator and therewith has become a law unto himself. He will be subjected to none but himself. He seeks to be autonomous. He knows that he is a creature and ought to be subject to the law of his creator, end quote. But man revolts against this, quote. He makes himself the final reference point in all predication, end quote. Sinful man is not neutral. His knowledge is geared to one end, to establish his own autonomy. The only relationship he will tolerate with God is a democratic one. On that Arminian basis, with man casting the deciding vote against God and Satan by voting for himself, man finds God tolerable. It is ridiculous to assume that there is anything neutral about man as he approaches Christ. Every non-neutral fibre of sinful man's being is a quiver as he approaches Christ and seeks either to eliminate Christ or to integrate him into his system. The Third Council of Constantinople meant to deal with monothelism, an attempt to integrate Jesus Christ into an implicitly non-Christian perspective. Monothelism conceded the victory to Chalcedon. It accepted as necessary to religious respectability the doctrine of the two natures, but it insisted that Christ was subject to one will only, the human will being either merged into the divine or absorbed by it. This doctrine represented an attempt by the Emperor Heraclius to unite the Eutychians and Monophysites with the Orthodox and bring religious unity to the empire. In the course of its history, monothelism gained many prominent advocates. Sergius, Patriarch of Constantinople, did the theological work for Heraclius and his successors. Pyrrhus, Paul and Peter continued it. Honorius, Pope of Rome, also advocated it. Other prominent monothelite churchmen were Theodorus of Ferran, Cyrus of Alexandria, Macarius of Antioch and Stephen, his disciple. All were condemned by name at the Sixth Council. Sophronius, a Palestinian monk, was early a leader in the struggle against monothelism. Martin I, Pope of Rome, also led in the battle against the heresy and was banished to the Crimea by the emperor. When Pope Martin stood before the civil authorities in Constantinople on trial, he was denied the right to call attention to the heresies of the monothelites. Quote, Don't mix here anything about the faith. You are on trial for high treason. We too are Christians and Orthodox, end quote. Martin replied, quote, Would to God you were, but even on this point I shall testify against you on the day of that dreadful judgment, end quote. A Greek abbot, Maximus, was also prominent in the battle against monothelism, and for this lie was scourged and had his right hand and his tongue cut off by the emperor, dying soon thereafter on August the 3rd, 662. 
St. Maximus had earlier been private secretary to, to Heraclius before entering the church. Maximus had been responsible for the Lateran Synod of 649, called by Martin I, and had written its condemnation of monothelism. Emperor Constans II had his right hand and tongue publicly cut off to prevent further writing and speaking for the faith by Maximus, who rejected every flattering and threatening effort to silence him. The men who defended the faith were aware of the perils. They were not immune from the fear of man, but they were even more subject to the fear of God. In the midst of each council was placed the Holy Gospels to indicate not only the authority of Scripture, but the presence of Jesus Christ as a sovereign head of every true council and Christian gathering. The intense earnestness of the delegates and their hostility to the slightest deviation from the faith rested on the belief that heresy represented not a lack of understanding, but a deliberate attempt to subvert and destroy the faith, to attack and abolish God, the Enlightenment has so warped man's perspective that men believe salvation is knowledge and sin is therefore ignorance. The will of man is therefore governed by his mind and the information available to the mind. But this psychology is alien to biblical faith. Man's sinful nature governs his mind and will and bends them to its purposes. Man's problem is not ignorance but sin, not a lack of knowledge but a will to abolish God from the world. The unregenerate man is governed by the desire to be his own God and to will the death of God. God can be abolished from philosophical consideration by variations of three ways. First, there can be an outright denial of God. It can be held that God does not exist and that the concept is unnecessary. Second, instead of a denial of God, the denial of man can be used to abolish God. If man be reduced to mere sensations or an animal whose mental processes are worthless, man cannot know God because, by definition, he can know nothing. To deny God means also to deny man. These two approaches go hand in hand. Charles Darwin relied on this denial of man. He did not deny that God seemed to be an inescapable concept and reality, that it was not possible to explain the world apart from him, but rather than acknowledge God, Darwin denied man and any validity to man's thinking and mind. His own admission of this fact is quite revelatory of his unwillingness to accept any thinking which led to God. In a letter to W. Graham of July the 3rd, 1881, Darwin told him, quote, Nevertheless, you have expressed my inward conviction, though far more vividly and clearly than I could have done, that the universe is not the result of chance, but then with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? End quote. Darwin did not conclude from this untrustworthiness of man's mind that his own scientific hypotheses were untrustworthy. It did not occur to him to invalidate science and evolution by this view of man. It was only used against God. This is, of course, childish thinking, but it is even more clearly sinful thinking. Third, God can be denied by an affirmation of God which leaves him as an adjunct of man or the captive of man. God can then be praised fulsomely, but the glory and the power are quickly transferred to man. The Monothelites were in effect abolishing God by an affirmation which introduced humanity into the Godhead and made man one with God, so that Christianity was in effect nullified. They did this in the name of Christianity, but the consequences were humanistic atrophy. At the Sixth Council, the letter of Pope Agatho was an important statement of the case against monothelism. Agatho strongly affirmed the position of Chalcedon, quote, But when we make a confession concerning one of the same three persons of that Holy Trinity, of the Son of God, or God the Word, and of the mystery of his adorable dispensation according to the flesh, we assert that all things are double 
in the one and the same our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, according to the evangelical tradition. That is to say, we confess his two natures, to wit, the divine and the human, of which and in which he, even after the wonderful and inseparable union, subsists. And we confess that each of his natures has its own natural propriety, and that the divine has all things that are divine without any sin. And we recognize that each one of the two natures of the one and the same incarnated, that is, humanated, humanity, word of God, is in him unconfusedly, inseparably and unchangeably intelligence alone discerning a unity to avoid the error of confusion. For we equally detest the blasphemy of division and of commixture. For when we confess two natures and two natural wills and two natural operations in our one Lord Jesus Christ, we do not assert that they are contrary or opposed one to the other, as those who err from the path of truth and accuse the apostolic tradition of doing. End quote. For Hellenism, the confusion and commixture were natural and necessary, hence its humanism. Matter represented the world of incohate being, whereas form represented divine being, and the universe is the product of the commixture of the two. The biblical perspective of created being and the uncreated and creating being of God was totally alien to Hellenism. Greek philosophy could understand a total commixture and confusion. It could not understand incarnation. As a result, as it approached the doctrine of the Incarnation, it tried to force it into the mould of commixture and confusion as the logically necessary step. Christ, as the supreme form, must of necessity be commingled with matter to provide the logical structure or logos for all men and all philosophy. The Monophysites were thus insistent on a single nature. Here in this one nature a commingling and confusion took place. But Chalcedon and Constantinople II blocked this from consideration by declaring it to be heresy. Logically, the Hellenic and especially the Neoplatonic tradition required the confusion and commixture, and so it reappeared as monothelism, the doctrine of two natures but one will. Had this doctrine triumphed, the Church would either have stagnated or become a new channel for the redevelopment of Hellenism. Both things happened, but the condemnation of monothelism made possible the survival of orthodoxy. From the Hellenic perspective, man's salvation evolved ascent on the scale of being into deification. Man progressively must forsake the world of matter for the world of form, that is, the spirit. Wherever Hellenism prevailed, their asceticism and monasticism prevailed. In the Western Church, asceticism and monasticism, after an early triumph, declined, and they are increasingly becoming relics rather than the central force. In the Monophysite churches, the monastic orders control all higher offices because they represented, by definition, the higher truth and power of the Church. The definition of faith of the Council spoke of the flesh and will of Christ's humanity as, quote, deified, end quote, but by this it meant that, under the doctrine of economic appropriations, the human flesh and will are totally governed by the divine nature and will, and were thus one without confusion with the deity. It was, the definition said, and quote, economic conversation, end quote. After reviewing the conclusions of the five previous councils, the definition declared, quote, Defining all this, we likewise declare that in him are two natural wills and two natural operations indivisibly, inconvertibly, inseparably, inconfusedly, according to the teaching of the Holy Fathers, and these two natural wills are not contrary the one to the other, God forbid, as the impious heretics assert, but his human will follows, and that not as resisting and reluctant, but rather as subject to his divine and omnipotent will. We glorify two natural operations indivisibly, immutably, inconfusedly, inseparably in the same our Lord Jesus Christ, our true God, that is to say, a divine operation and a human operation, according to the divine preacher Leo, who most distinctly asserts as follows, quote, For each form does in communion with the other what pertains properly to it, the word, namely, doing that which pertains to the word, and the flesh that which pertains to the flesh. End quote. 
For we will not admit one natural operation in God and the creature, as we will not exalt into the divine essence what is created, nor will we bring down the glory of the divine nature to the place suited to the creature. We recognize the miracles and the sufferings as of one and the same person, but of one or the other nature of which he is and in which he exists, as Cyril admirably says. Preserving, therefore, the inconfusedness and indivisibility, we make briefly this whole confession, believing our Lord Jesus Christ to be one of the Trinity and after the Incarnation our true God, we say that his two natures shone forth in his one subsistence in which he both performed the miracles and endured the sufferings through the whole of his economic conversation, and that's not in appearance only, but in very deed, and this by reason of the difference of nature which must be recognised in the same person, for although joined together, yet each nature wills and does the things proper to it, and that indivisibly and inconfusedly, Wherefore, we confess two wills and two operations concurring most fitly in him for the salvation of the human race. End quote. Monothelism, the council said plainly, did two things. First, it exalted, quote, into the divine essence what is created, end quote. And second, it brought, quote, down the glory of the divine nature to the place suited to the creature, end quote. Against this humanistic confusion, the council was adamant. In explaining their definition to the emperor, the council, declaring that Satan, quote, has raised up the very ministers of Christ against him, end quote, explained its decision in the Prosphoneticus, quote, And as we recognize two natures, also we recognize two natural wills and two natural operations, for we dare not say that either of the natures which are in Christ in his incarnation is without a will and operation, lest in taking away the properties of those natures we likewise take away the natures of which they are the properties. For we neither deny the natural will of his humanity or its natural operation, lest we also deny what is the chief thing of the dispensation for our salvation, and lest we attribute passions to the Godhead, Therefore, we declare that in him there are two natural wills and two natural operations proceeding commonly and without division. End quote. The Monothelites, by absorbing the human will into the divine will, opened the door for the similar absorption of the wills of all redeemed men into the divine will, so that sanctification became progressive deification. Neander observed concerning this, quote, the question concerning the relations of the human and the divine will to each other in Christ was connected also in a way that deserves notice with the question respecting the relation of the human to the divine will in the redeemed in their state of perfection. At least, many among the monothelites supposed the final result of the perfect development of the divine life in believers would be in them, as in the case of Christ, a total absorption of the human will in God's will so that in all there would be a subjective as well as objective identity of will which consistently carried out would lead to the pantheistic notion of an entire absorption of all individuality of existence in the one original spirit. Maximus well understood this and contended earnestly against the notion, end quote. In 711, a monothelite, Philippicus or Bardanes, became emperor and the persecution of orthodoxy was resumed for two years until Anastasius II dethroned him and ended the persecution. John of Damascus, 680-764, was the last Eastern theologian to give the issue significant attention. In his, quote, Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, end quote, John made it clear that any other than the Orthodox position was a denial of the Incarnation. Quote, but if those who declare that Christ has only one nature should say also that nature is a simple one, they must admit either that he is God, pure and simple, and thus reduce the incarnation to a mere pretense, or that he is only man, according to Nestorius, and how then about his being, quote, perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, end quote. And when can Christ be said to be two natures if they hold that he is of one composite nature after the union? 
For it is surely clear to everyone that before the Union, Christ's nature was one. End quote. The Third Council of Constantinople made it clear that the Incarnation was not a pretense, it was real. The Council made it equally clear that the ostensible Christianity of the Monothelites was a pretense. It was a humanism which in effect abolished God, and no theologian could miss its implications. They, for their part, declared, quote, We will not exalt into the divine essence what is created, nor will we bring down the glory of the divine nature to the place suited to the creatures, end quote. The position of the Monothelites was a deadly one, and despite the earnestness of some of its humble believers at some points in the history of the Monothelites, as well as the Monophysites, the position was one of sterility and decay. It was not Orthodox Christianity, and it had none of the vigour of biblical faith. It was not an honest and open humanism, and thus it could not develop in terms of its real meaning. Its basic vigour was in hostility, and its destiny has been decay and death. <laughs>